Greetings and welcome to VDI and the Cloud, the Future of IT or a Modern Day Money Pit. You know, the title alone scares people to death. And so when you think about it, the people that are actually most afraid of a title like this are the folks who are trying to sell VDI and folks who are trying to sell cloud services. So we're going to address this subject. We're going to do it from uh, a non-judgmental uh, perspective to start with. But we are going to present the facts, the hype versus the help. So let me introduce myself to start with. My name is J. Peter Brzezzi. And perhaps some of you already know me. Perhaps some of you have watched my training videos with TrainSignal. Let me give you a modest bio of myself. So I'm a Microsoft MVP for Exchange uh, with a variety of different acronyms that follow my name, as you can see here. You might be wondering, why does an MVP for Exchange think he should be speaking about VDI or cloud services or anything of that sort? Well, in addition to being an MVP for Exchange and heavily involved in the Exchange world, I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer. I'm a technical author. I've written over a dozen books that have been sold internationally. I speak at conferences like Tech Mentor, Tech Ed, Mech Connections, and others. And I'm a journalist for InfoWorld. I write the Enterprise Windows column. So in that role specifically, I have actually spent quite a bit of time covering the world of virtual desktop infrastructure. I've spent quite a bit of time talking to vendors and talking to folks who have actually been implementing VDI in their environments. At the same time, I have also spent quite a bit of time talking to folks who are implementing cloud services. They're looking at infrastructure as a service and, and other solutions, whether it's platform or software as a service. And so it gives me an opportunity to look at it from both angles, those who are selling the solutions and those who are buying those solutions and seeing how it's working out for them. It gives me a broader view, perhaps, than some who are they're stuck at the mercy of the vendor. They're reading the vendor marketing paraphernalia, and they're thinking, OK, this is, this is the right move. Well, we're going to discuss whether or not it truly is the right move. Now, before we get started into the session, uh, let's just give a little background to this session and how it uh, really comes together here. So it's a combination of two different talks that I give at tech conferences that revolve around the buzzwords VDI and cloud services. And the whole point of these different talks is that these solutions, VDI and cloud services, as different as they are, they're very similar in the sense that at times, the marketing paraphernalia leads it to indicate that there's more hype involved than actual help. And so we look and we see, wow, VDI is going to solve the world's problems. It's actually going to solve the, uh, the greenhouse effect, it's going to solve all of your energy problems. It's going to reverse the recession. Cloud services is going to make problems on premise a thing of the past. You'll never have a security issue again. Uh, you're going to be able to um, really just you know, fly in the clouds and enjoy life and, uh, you know, sit on a beach and monitor everything from there. So sometimes the marketing hype is really just that. And as a result, you start throwing money at this and you start thinking, this is the way to go. I'm going to start putting money into this. I'm going to start pushing it. Uh, I'm going to promote it with decision makers in my organization. And of course, they're hearing the same buzzwords. And so money starts going in that direction. Now, what's a money pit? Well, the dictionary.com defines it as any entity or venture which requires more money for maintenance and drains financial resources. Money pit. So unfortunately, VDI as well as cloud services could become a money pit. Um, it, the cost of these things can add up. The nice thing about them is that the initial upfront cost is usually less than an on-premise infrastructure or usually less than going out and purchasing all of these various machines in the case of VDI. But that doesn't necessarily mean that down the road you're not going to be pouring more and more money into that hole. Okay. So now you get the point as far as the, the reason for the session. Um, let's jump right into a discussion then of VDI itself. We're going to split these two into two different topics because they are two separate subjects, of course. So let's focus on VDI for a moment. VDI provides centralized desktop management. The value of VDI, regardless of the vendor, although obviously various vendors have different you know, added management features that are included whether you're going with a Citrix solution or a VMware solution or a Hyper-V solution with Microsoft, it doesn't really matter in this context. The overall point of VDI is that you have the ability to have all of your, uh, your desktop infrastructure in a virtualized environment. And uh, typically, there still has to be on-premise uh, because of the connectivity that's required. And you're looking at situations where persons can connect in now maybe they're using a fat client, maybe they're using a, an old Windows XP box that is just sitting there on the desk 
and you want to provide them that Windows 7 desktop. I would say Windows 8, but let's stick with Windows 7 as a more reasonable desktop that you would want to provide. It's a, it's a real extreme jump to think that you're going to take an XP box, a fat client, and have them do a remote desktop connection to a VDI-based um, system, and then it's going to be Windows 8. You can do it. You, there's, there's no doubt you can do it. But um, the problems with Windows 8 is that it's really based off of more of that touch interface. And, uh, and it's doable through remote desktop, but not as clean as Windows 7 for most workers. So let's just assume it's a Windows 7 system. And so now that you have all of your Windows 7 systems uh, for, let's say, a department that you have set up with VDI, now that they're all in one place, you can actually centralize the management of it. And you can do things like provide updates and so forth. So th there's real value here. Uh, that's the point here, is that I don't want you to think that this is a bashing session on VDI or the cloud. It's not. Under certain circumstances, VDI may be one of your best solutions. So I'll give you a couple of different uh, scenarios where I've seen it work really well. Uh, one is factory floor. So you've got a factory floor, let's say 30 employees, and this is a true story. This is a, this is a real company that uh, I did some consulting with. And they were having problems with their systems just constantly getting beat up due to dust getting into those systems and, and just you know having to replace them repeatedly. So now they're looking at upgrading. They want to go to Windows 7. They're using Windows XP. How do they do it? They want to give their, their people the latest and greatest operating system, but you know, they can't do it with these systems. They don't want to keep buying you know, expensive systems and having them just get destroyed by the dust. So the idea was, look, can you go with a VDI solution? And uh, they looked at that. They looked at ways to do that using as many of their old XP systems as they could until those would die out. And then they would replace them with thin or zero client connectivity. And so those are smaller boxes, less concerned about dust and so forth, cheaper um, because they're not full-fledged systems. They simply are uh, little clients that can be plugged into the network. You plug in a mouse, a keyboard, and a monitor, and you're good to go. In that case, it was actually a cheaper solution to go with VDI. Uh, another great opportunity for VDI in an environment might be a school system. You have everybody coming in. You want to provide a consistent environment, but everybody's coming in with different types of solutions, whether it's their tablets or whether they're coming in with uh, various flavors of Windows. So to do that, you can set up VDI, you can set up virtual systems within your school system. Um, this works great with BYOD. Bring your own device. So you have folks coming in with, let's say, iPads. You want them to feel like they're bringing in their own device and they are happy to do so and they've just paid for this device. You didn't have to pay for it. They brought it in from home. And you want them to feel happy about that. They're getting to use their device. At the same time, you want to provide a solution where you can provide security, you can push down group policies to their systems. Well, you, you can't have the best of both worlds there. You just can't do it. But with VDI, you can. They can do a remote desktop connection off of their tablet. They get their desktop right there on their iPad. It's fully secured with a group policy and any other administrative settings. When they're done, they close out, they go home. They have their iPad. They get to use what they like to use, but ultimately, they still have the all of the, the fun of having a Windows desktop. I say fun, it's really work. But they have that all through a VDI infrastructure. So this is something that really does have value. But you'll note that I keep pushing it as a solution that is limited. It's not that you take your whole organization and say, listen, we're all going to switch to VDI today. That is a mistake. So that may happen, though. VDI is obviously very futuresque. Uh, we may see in the future a world that switches over to VDI when we can eliminate some of the problems when it comes to connectivity and storage and so forth. But ultimately, you know, currently, it's great for limited deployments. So we may even see, as you can see on the slides here, we can, may even see a cloud-based VDI solution in public clouds. Uh, this may happen soon enough where uh, no matter where you are, you can connect up and get a desktop without having much in terms of your client itself. Whether it's a tablet or some other client, it might be a, a thin or zero client that can connect up to the cloud and get its operating system from there. Now that may be fine, but obviously we don't just want an operating system in the cloud. Um, we don't want just a, you know, many may survive well with a, with a very simple operating system like the Google, uh, the Google Chrome operating system that they have on the Chromebooks. Those are great, but they're not as robust certainly as like a Microsoft Windows operating system. And so for those who prefer that robust operating system, having it in the cloud currently may not quite work so well. So this is something that's futuresque. We may see this in the near future. However, here's the problem. 
So VDI begins with the need for tremendous infrastructure and upfront costs. And uh, look, this is just the truth. You're going to have to pay money. You need to put in your own little mini data center. You're going to have to consider the cost in terms of licensing and so forth, getting it all together. You have to make tremendous decisions regarding the types of solutions you're going to go with. You're going to go with VMware as a solution. What management options come with that? Are there other, you know, perhaps the big three are, uh, you're looking at those three, Citrix, VMware, Microsoft, and you're saying, maybe I can go with something else. So it's going to take some time to do a little bit of research, to look at costs. You're going to have to put in this infrastructure. And you know, ultimately, when you see it on paper, when you see VDI on paper, it looks cheap. Right? That's the whole thing. It's like, look, instead of buying all these different systems and managing all of these different systems, VDI is going to save you on the management. It's going to save you on um, all of the, this frustration that you typically have with a, a traditional deployment. But really, where's the bottleneck? Where's the problem? Uh, storage. Storage is one of the biggest problems. There's an excessive amount of storage needed. Right? Now, granted, you may have a deduplication part of VDI that will help to limit the storage. It's not necessarily the storage itself. Um, it's really the lack of storage optimization. In other words, everybody has to access their operating system as well as their storage through this mini data center that you've set up. Maybe it's even a large data center. But this on-premise data center that is now going to be accessed by persons around the company, depending on the number of people that are going through the network lines to access this storage, this operating system and storage, this could become a real bottleneck. Right? So storage throughput is considered really the bottleneck of VDI. Everyone says, well, also, isn't there also a problem in terms of connectivity? Yes, that could be a problem, but the bottleneck is in storage throughput. And that becomes an expensive performance bottleneck as well. So there are solutions, but again, now you're looking at other solutions to try to fix this problem. So you might say, well, okay, but VDI still offers centralized desktop management. Yes, but again, in addition to this storage throughput problem, there's also a connectivity problem at times. You need to have solid, high bandwidth connections, right? So you may have centralized desktop management, but you still need to make sure your end users can access their desktop. And so in order for that to happen, you have to make sure that network is optimized, that you have high bandwidth throughput for that. And so again, that could be a, that could be a problem. It could be a bottleneck, depending on your environment, or it simply could be um, a source of contention if connections are constantly being dropped. Okay, so now we've looked at the good and the bad of VDI. Where it can help in an environment, where you might consider it, where you should consider it, but we've also looked at where it might, you know, and if you're thinking about maybe deploying this through your whole organization, this is something that still is future-esque. It's still something that is expensive because there are additional costs and it's also expensive in the sense that it could be a frustration for your end users and is that really worth the cost of that? So what other options are there? What else can you do instead of VDI? So here's the thing. Whenever I speak about this at conferences and I throw this slide up, folks literally, they groan. They see terminal services and they groan. And look, here's the facts. The fact is, is that just because it's not new and fancy like VDI, it's not all sexy like VDI, that doesn't mean it's not the best and most cost effective option. Right? So look, when you're, when you're sitting around you know, and, and drinking beers with your buddies and saying, hey, guess what? We just installed VDI for our whole uh, environment. And, uh, and you're, you're sitting there and you're thinking, uh, you know, that's awesome. And they're thinking, yeah, we still have terminal services. You know what? They shouldn't feel bad about that. Maybe that's the better solution. Maybe you've just spent $150,000 that you didn't need to spend. Right? And this isn't the first time that this has happened. I mean, look, anybody who's been in this business for any period of time, they remember back in, let's say, 2000, 2001, when SAN solutions were all the rage. You remember this? Storage area networks, all the rage, NAS, right? Network attached storage. This was a big deal. You know, I had, I worked for a, a solution company, Commvault Systems, and I was their SAN NAS expert at that time. And uh, right in my office, I had a $60,000 network appliance, NetApp appliance. And it's like, this thing was just a box. It was just a stupid box that, you know, could be connected to the network. Big deal. 60 grand. Right? So these things were expensive. Storage area networks were finicky. You're using fiber channel and all sorts of other junk and it never worked. And you know, it just it was miserable. You had to boot up devices in a certain order to get it to work. I mean, this is what people were resting their hope on. And yet the poor man's SAN, which was really just a redundant Ethernet connection to back to your storage through regular network, um, this was considered, you know, something to look be looked down upon. It was cheap, it worked better, and it wasn't finicky, but that was looked down upon. So it's the same thing here, folks. Terminal services, it's not new and fancy. 
but it works. It works. It may be the most cost-effective option, and it may be the best option to provide all that you need in terms of you want centralized management, you want the ability to provide the desktop to your BYOD you know, users and so forth, terminal services may be the best way to go. So just saying. Another option is client-side hypervisors. Right Here you have an opportunity to utilize uh, desktop virtualization without the need for high bandwidth connections. So the value of client-side hypervisors is that you're using the hypervisor and you're using a virtual system that can be updated, can be managed and so forth and can all be done while still running on the person's literal laptop or desktop or whatever. Now you might say, okay, but isn't a client-side hypervisor solution the same as just installing the system right there on the, uh, right on the bare metal? Isn't that the same thing when you're talking about installing it on a desktop? Yes and no. Um, typically when you look at client-side hypervisor solutions, we're not just talking about installing, let's say, Windows 7 on, type of a, on top of a hypervisor. In this case, actually, Hyper-V, uh, rather, in this case, Windows 8 might be the better solution because there is a built-in client Hyper-V right there. But if you're looking at client-side hypervisors, all the big vendors are selling them as well. So, you know, you can look at that. You might look at Virtual PC or a couple of other, um, not in the top big three names, Citrix, VMware, Microsoft. But look for a couple of other computing companies out there that offer client-side hypervisors because they also offer management solutions that allow you to centrally manage the desktops and make it so that in the event someone does lose their system or there is a problem, that they can get the the new flavor of their system downloaded back to their machine pretty quickly. So client-side hypervisors is another potential alternative, something you should consider. The last one is more my favorite in terms of solutions. Um, and it's not that I'm saying it's better than terminal services. That's not the case. I'm just saying it's my favorite because it's something that nobody even has even heard of, and I don't know why. It's called IDV, or Intelligent Desktop Virtualization. You might be thinking, what? I've never heard of this. A good example of it is Winova Mirage, and you might say, never heard of them either, but you know what? who heard of them? VMware. They heard of them, and it's a perfect example of what intelligent desktop virtualization can do. So let me just explain this one, because most folks know what terminal services are. Most understand client-side hypervisors. IDV is, a, is the newcomer to the discussion. So uh, basically, oops, I went backwards. Here we go. Basically, IDV, intelligent desktop virtualization. You take a standard system, or even a virtual system, it doesn't matter if you're, let's say, using the client-side hypervisor. Um, you take a standard or virtual system, and you install a 2 megabyte client, which connects to a server. Let's say if we're talking about Lenovo Mirage, it connects to a Mirage server. And basically it saves an image of the PC. Now the full image isn't uploaded, only the bits that are different from other saved images. So obviously after you do your first one, if you're doing Windows 7 systems, then it knows that it already has a Windows 7 system, so it does, you know, it does separate the bits and says, okay, I only need what's different on this system, system B from system A. It does on-the-fly deduplication with high-performance WAN protocol connectivity. So it's fast, it's easy, it deduplicates. It's a great solution. It also allows you to do a full client inventory. It's able to inventory the hardware and the software of each system that you install the client on. It makes disaster recovery easier because in the event of a problem, all you have to do, get a new system, uh, install this two megabyte client and boom, it's, will, it'll automatically update the system with your previous backed up um, image. Updates and patches are made easier. There's no high bandwidth connect connection needed for users to access their data. So I personally think IDV is just really a great solution. And now that it's in the hands of VMware, it's worth pursuing, worth looking into. So again, folks, my goal today was not to turn you off of VDI completely. The idea is that VDI is a great solution in certain circumstances, but know your options. Know what your options in terms of costs, in terms of what are you truly looking for out of the solution, and obviously if your goal is to simply have the, the latest and greatest, the futuresque, sexy solution, then absolutely go with VDI. There it is. If your goal is to make a smart decision for your company to consider whether or not the costs of VDI are, are wise and, and worth investing in and so forth, then pause for a moment. You may still go with VDI. But pause. Take stock of some of the other options, take stock of the price, and see if this is really a solution you need to deploy, or perhaps if it's a solution that you can only deploy or only need to deploy to certain individuals within the organization. Okay, let's switch gears. Let's switch to the cloud. Uh, I'm just going to tell you a quick little story, just something funny. Um, so I'm sitting at a Churrascaria, which is a Brazilian steakhouse, and uh, perhaps if you've never gone to one, you definitely should try one. Uh, but anyway, I'm sitting there with a friend of mine, and he holds up his iPhone, and he says, you know, I just moved everything to the cloud. 
And I said, everything what? He says, all my music, all my files, everything. It's all in the iCloud. And he actually, he, I swear, he looked up in the sky as if the cloud was something up in the air. And, uh, and I said to him, I said, uh, give me a moment. And I went to my phone and I looked up basically Apple's data center. And I said to him, I said, you see this picture? And he says, yeah. I said, so ultimately what you basically just said is that you just moved all of your music and documents and everything to North Carolina. And he said, um, no, no, it's in the cloud. And again, I swear he looked, he, he denies it, but I swear he looked up in the sky. And I said to him, I said, you know there's really no cloud holding your data. You have to understand, this is a data center. Uh, Apple has one they just opened in North Carolina. And basically what you did was you copied your music from your system to some other computer over in North Carolina. So there you go. <laughs> so, you know, when we think about cloud services, it's good to remember what is what it is. Because I think it confuses folks. I think they get all worked up about the cloud. They keep saying the cloud. I thought it was funny on the Super Bowl, the um, the Amy Poehler commercial for was it Best Buy, where she was asking the guy, you know, what's the cloud? Are we in the cloud? Is the cloud here? You know, it, and and that's I think the problem folks have. The cloud is basically a bunch of data centers. Now everybody has a different data center. So Google has their you know Google Drive. Microsoft has SkyDrive, and so they offer software you know solutions with um, their data centers are in. Indonesia, Redmond, I think they have some in Brazil, they have Ireland, um, so you know they're, they're spread out pretty good. Um, and so everybody has one. Dropbox has their own data centers and folks like being able to store their data. Okay, so that's great. But what about um, infrastructure as a service? What about uh, software as a service? Things like that. The main focus of this discussion is infrastructure as a service. As far as whether or not it makes sense to move your infrastructure to the cloud. So that's the main focus for what we're talking about when it comes to cloud services today. All right, so now if we look at cloud services, specifically when it comes to infrastructure, so we see the evolution here. We see that business continuity, it drove the push for the modern IT data center. The high standards were made for redundancy being essential. So, you know, obviously we, we used to have these, uh, these rooms, server rooms and so forth, and the server room evolved. It evolved into a data center. Sometimes that data center is on-premise, Sometimes it's off-premise. Um, sometimes you know you, you have it in a storage area that's purpose, you know, purposely been designed for the data center. And so that's what's happened. And so over time, as you can see in the middle box, data centers have transformed to include virtualization, greater automation, uh, to include patch management, compliance, all these things, improved security. And so these things have evolved. So the natural push to the cloud you know, came next. That's where ISPs, they started seeing an opportunity. They said, you know, we can host, you know, being that folks are not literally going to see their servers at the data centers, being that the data centers oftentimes are, are off-premise, well, why don't we handle this? We will handle the data center side, and we can host data center servers, and we could start selling this as a solution, as a service. So cloud services evolve, uh, especially from the infrastructure perspective, through all of that. And perhaps, you know, depending on who's listening out there, maybe you've used cloud services in a variety of different ways and maybe you didn't even think about the fact that it was running in the cloud or didn't think that it was considered a cloud service. But if you have a Gmail account, right, that's a solution that's running in the cloud. You're getting, you know, email as a service, so, you know, or you might call it software as a service. Um, if you have a web server, let's say through GoDaddy, now if you have the, the simple solution where they're hosting the platform for you, and you're simply uploading files, your HTML files, okay, that's basic. But in some cases, you might actually have a virtual server. Someone actually has put together a server for you. Um, perhaps you have you know, various service level agreements in place so that you worry about um, working on the server. And maybe it's a web server, maybe it's something else, but you worry about the server. They worry about making sure it's backed up. They worry about making sure that everything is, is smooth. Um, so these are these are some of the things that um, perhaps you've played with already and now perhaps you're thinking you know I'd really like to move everything to the cloud now in some cases you might be looking at hosted solutions perhaps you have an on-premise exchange solution and you're thinking I'm gonna go to office 365 why well because office 365 offers you exchange SharePoint it offers you link you know personally I think it's a great solution especially for small businesses um, there are small businesses and and really anything from you know one employee up to, to 100, let's say, you know, I think they should definitely get rid of any on-premise solutions they have, move it to the cloud, especially if it's not your core competency, if this is not what you want to be focused on. Not only that, but the, uh, the Office 365 solution, and I, I'll admit it, I'm a Microsoft loyalist, so 
you know, you might be thinking, what about Google services? Okay, that's true. You know, if you want 1990s solutions, you can go back to Google. But yeah, you see, there's my loyalist side coming out. But no, in all honesty, folks, um, if you look at price and you look at what's offered in terms of feature set, with the Office 365 solution, you're really looking at um, Exchange, what's going to be Exchange 2013 in the near, near future. You're looking at SharePoint 2013. You're looking at Link 2013. I mean, the robust set of features is just unbelievable. In fact, I know folks who are still using other hosted solutions, and it just shocks me. It just like, you know, it, it angers me actually, especially if they've asked my opinion and I've said, go to Office 365, and they're still using whatever, you know, dinosaur service that they've been using for the last three or four years. It's like, please just make the move. But anyway, I digress. So, you know, in those cases, that's, that's smart. But really, what about in circumstances where you're thinking about moving your entire infrastructure to the cloud, or as much of it as possible. So that's where you can have some, some other concerns. So let's talk about the seven key cloud promises that have been made. And uh, we're going to look at Amazon as a, as a good example. We're going to pick on Amazon because really they, they really made it big in this world, um, but they've had their ups and downs as well. They've had a few lumps. So we're going to look at the reality, the hype first, the help in terms of the seven key cloud promises. So one is that the cloud makes distributed architecture easy. The second one is that the cloud offers new security advantages. The third is that the cloud lets you scale on demand. The fourth is that cloud makes supercomputing accessible. The fifth is that the cloud drives innovation. The sixth is that big data demands big cloud. And the seventh is mobile and cloud are a perfect matchup. Okay, now you might be looking at this. And you might be nodding your head yes. Raise your hand if you're nodding your head yes. No, I'm just kidding. I can't see you. <laughs> I hope none of you raised your hand. If you raised your hand, it's okay. We're not going to pick on you. But you know, remember, this is a webinar. I can't see you. So, um, so here's the thing. If you're looking at this and you are nodding your head yes to every single one of these main points, then I have to tell you something. Don't take this the wrong way. You've been brainwashed. It's true. Now. Here's why. You might be saying, no, 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 I'm not brainwashed. The cloud does let you scale on demand. Yes, it does. The cloud does make supercomputing accessible. It certainly does. But let's, let's just take a step back here because you want to pride yourself on also being able to see the reality, not just the hype of a single line statement. Okay? What is the reality behind each of these statements? What do we truly see? Let's talk about it. So, okay, a little harder to read, a lot more stuff going on here. Let's talk about this first one. The cloud makes distributed architecture easy. Okay, that's true. And Amazon has promised that, and they do a great job. They do a lot to shield their customers from the complexity of creating their own highly distributed system. There's no doubt about that. But there is still a certain amount of complexity that's involved, right? It's not necessarily easy. Not only that, but despite the global scale of Amazon solutions, and they do, they have a global scale of things. Despite that, and the many redundancies, Amazon doesn't have a great record of keeping its systems up and running, right? So sure, you're distributed. Now the whole point of distributed architecture, the idea is I'm so distributed that I'm never going to have a failure that really knocks me out of the game here. And so if you're thinking, I need that, because obviously if you're going to put your infrastructure in the cloud or really anything in the cloud, the last thing you want is an outage. So that's why you go with the distributed architecture in the first place. So the idea is no outages. We're going to be fine. Even if something suffers on one, one site, we're going to be fine. No, but here's the thing. There were two significant outages in 2011 alone with Amazon. Again, we're going to pick on them because they're the big boy. There was a multi-day incident in April of 2011. It took out services on the U.S. East Coast. There was another multi-day incident in August that impacted multiple availability zones. So here again, you might have a, a different zone and you're thinking, I'm safe, right? But sometimes this affected zones that were right next to each other. That's not supposed to happen. That's not supposed to happen with fault tolerant architecture, but it did. It's still a work in progress, these solutions, these cloud solutions, so just be aware of that. If you're not so concerned with having 100% constant uptime through distributed architecture, fine, then the cloud may still be a great solution for you, but you have to be aware of that. Now, some have actually, they've altered their viewpoint. One good example is Zynga, which is a game site. You, you might have played some of the games that Zynga makes, right? Um, you know, the way that they have changed things, they have decided that it's better to own than to rent. They used to have an 80% dependence on Amazon Web Services. They have flipped that 
to a 20% dependence. Now they have a public cloud usage focused on scaling up new games before taking them in-house. So they still use Amazon services, but they use it for a specific purpose, but then bring everything back in-house. They feel it's better to own than to rent. Okay. So there's number one. Does, does the cloud make distributed architecture easy? Yes, there's some truth in that, but in the case of uh, when it comes to the case of uh, outages and being concerned about that, the fact of the matter is is that these outages still occur. Oh, as a side point, you know we have Q and A, and uh, you're welcome to ask questions as we go along. I'm monitoring it as we go, and towards the end we'll also have a Q and A session. So I see from Craig that there's a question: Will hardware planning for VDI implementation be discussed? Um, not in this session, Craig. I mean, there's a lot that we could talk about with hardware planning, um, as far as the different pieces of the puzzle. The other thing with hardware planning is that I never recommend you just go with one vendor. I know all vendors like, you know, buy everything with them, put all your eggs in one basket. But the honest fact of the matter with VDI, you know, just from my working with it and consulting on it, is that sometimes it's better to get pieces from different vendors because they might have a better a thin client or they might have a better um, way to eliminate the storage throughput issue. So it just depends on who's the best. And that's the nice thing. It kind of reminds me of putting computers together back in the late 90s you know where you could you know everything was kind of opened and you could just open the box and you could flip out different things change the motherboard change the processors you know it's the same thing with VDI it's all mix and match so that would be a really good webinar perhaps that we'll do in the future um, okay going back to number two cloud offers new security advantages now you might be thinking Pete look there's no way that you can tell me that there aren't cloud security advantages to doing things on premise um, alright that's true there are some advantages but the cloud is far from invulnerability, right? It, it, look, there were very public breaches with credit card number thefts that have occurred. So that's a concern. In addition, having everything in a cloud-based solution may help malware creators because they know that they only have to go after one type of solution or set of solutions in order to breach multiple things. So there's real evidence, that's, and that's a true thing. This is not just a made-up thing, but there's real evidence that cloud computing tools help malware creators. Okay. There was an example uh, last summer, cyber criminals were using Amazon Web Services to spread financial stealing malware. So there you go. Um, and there's more. We could talk about different examples. Um, but there was a problem with Amazon, you know, in the same, uh, same uh, theme. It took Amazon 60 hours to shut down various malicious links that were being thrown out there. So again, it doesn't necessarily shield you from every security issue. Um, as far as the security breaches, Amazon owns Zappos. It was one of the largest, uh, one of the latest e-commerce sites to suffer a security breach with exposing credit card information. So th this happens, right? New security advantages. Now, when it comes to your infrastructure, there's one thing I can tell you for a certainty. With a cloud-based solution, you have no idea who is handling the security for your environment. In the case of these various breaches, it's not just that there was a breach. It means that somebody forgot to do their job. Breaches are are, uh, are preventable if security patches are, are certainly put in place if everything is up to date you know then you can really prevent these public breaches but somebody dropped the ball now when somebody drops the ball in your company you know it and you can look the person right in the eye um, when you hire someone for your security you can look them in the eye you know where they live you know what uh, training they've had you know and and so you can have a little bit more of a hands-on when it comes to your company security in some cases you need that depending on the type of business you're in uh, you need that type of security whether it's banks hospitals government organizations so it's uh, it's a problem when it comes to the cloud because do we know uh, who's handling our security no we have no idea no idea so it's you know and that's one of the negative sides to the cloud still you might say I'd still rather trust someone who's handling it every single second of the day to perhaps someone I have to hire or to myself perhaps you're just so swamped you cannot focus on every single security problem that might come your way. Fair enough. Then yes, I would agree the cloud is the better solution because it offers those security advantages. You know, and in all honesty with the, uh, the breaches that have taken place, it's very limited in terms of number of breaches compared to the uh, number of sites that are being handled and the number of organizations that are in the cloud. Now the next one is the cloud lets you scale on demand. Yes, it does. And with various cloud solutions I've used, it's wonderful. I mean, if any of you have ever used a cloud-based solution to scale, to, uh, to spin up servers and to, to get something working really quickly, let's say you're trying to test something, um, let's say you're working on a, a solution and you just, you can't seem to get 
permissions from the, the higher ups to give you a, a VM system on premise. So you throw up a, a server or two in the cloud. Um, it, just wonderful, right? But at the same time, the negative is that you get charged for this, you know. You know, you might think that the cloud is cheaper, but you get charged. And if you forget to spin down these servers that you're testing on, you know, again, the, the cloud is great for research and development, but in terms of the long haul, you're paying for those servers to be up and running. So, you know, we're, we're, looking at, um, we're looking at the spiky demand. And what we mean by spiky demand, spiky demand is, hey, I'm looking to test something. I want to see if it works. I need to spin up five servers now, as opposed to baseline operations, which is like, hey, um, I have a SQL server, a SharePoint server, an Exchange server. I need to have those up and running 24-7. Those are baseline. Those are the things that you need to keep working, you know, constantly. So here we see that, you know, the cloud is a great solution for spiky demand. Um, but when it comes to baseline capacity, it, a lot of folks are saying it's cheaper to do it yourself, right, to, to own rather than rent. Um, the next one is cloud makes supercomputing accessible. And yes, that is true. There's two things about this. First of all, um, I'm looking at currently a, an attendee list of 55 folks on the line. Now, you know, of the 55, and you can even put it in the questions and answers, I'd love to see if any of you are, are doing this. How many of you actually need supercomputing? You know, we're talking about high performance computing, right? I mean, if you're working for Boeing or you're working for, let's say, a pharmaceutical company, you're trying to cure cancer, you know, you might need some real supercomputing. And the cloud is an amazing solution for that. It really is. In fact, when you look at the, uh, the actual, um, numbers in terms of folks that are actually working with the cloud to do supercomputing, they are saving tons of money. But one good example, um, this firm was able to harness more than 50,000 cores of Amazon Web Services capacity within a matter of hours. And he said he packed 20 to 25 million dollars worth of some supercomputing infrastructure into the time that he used. At Amazon's cloud rates, the cost was just $5,000 per hour. Can you see how that's unbelievable? So the response, according to this person, Jason Stowe, CEO of Cycle Computing, he said, this means any researcher with a National Science Foundation grant or any person at an academic institution or anyone at a large corporation can now do science that's impossible to do on an internal system in so short a time frame. Is that true? That is true. Yes, again, we're not here to bash the cloud. This is amazing, the ability to do supercomputing. I mean, it's unbelievable that you can do this type of research with cloud-based solutions. However, again, if, you're not, if supercomputing is not one of your needs, then check that off your list as far as, is this something you need to go toward? Do you need to move your infrastructure toward the cloud? Well, if this is not one of your needs, and even if it is one of your needs, you may use the cloud then to perform various super. You spin up the servers, you do your tests, you do your research and development, you spin them back down. Again, that's what we would consider spiky demand, not baseline operations. So consider what your needs are in terms of, you know, using the cloud one way or the other. Um, okay, let's see. You know, we have another question. Hey, Craig, you're my question guy. This is great. So it says, uh, we're considering deployment of VDI for college students. Can you refer me to a source that would help us plan for VDI and hopefully al arrive at a basic cost estimate? Yes, I can. Um, let's do this. Craig, we're going to have you email me. I'm going to put my email address up at the end of this web webinar. So I'm going to ask you to hang on for a little bit longer, and I'll throw that up there at the end. And then email me. We'll work through it from there. Um, and I like your comment that you don't, uh, you don't have a need for supercomputing, I guess, is, uh, is what you're responding. So that's good. And, and you know what? I can tell you I don't see anyone else responding and saying that they have a need for supercomputing either. Um, it, but it's cool to know. It's cool to know that there are good reasons for moving your infrastructure to the cloud. You just may not have those reasons. So then in that case, there's no need to spend the money and the effort and the, you know, worry about it. So another one is that the cloud drives innovation. Um, okay, that's true. So the question there is, are you involved in business experimentation? In other words, um, for small business or startups, uh, the cloud is a great solution because you don't have to, let's say you have an idea and you say, I'm going to start a small business. Um, I'm going to create some kind of website that's going to provide some kind of service and you're like, it's going to be awesome and everyone's going to love it and I'm going to make a million dollars and I saw the GoDaddy commercials with the guy on the airplane and everyone's like, you know, you had an idea but you didn't execute it and so now you're still sitting at home that this guy's on a jet with, uh, uh, what is it, Danica Patrick, she's flying the jet, you know, it's like, okay. You might be thinking I was talking about the other GoDaddy commercial, but no, I'm not even going to talk about that one. So the, 
the thing is is that yes if you have a business idea but you don't necessarily have you know the money to actually set up the infrastructure to host things internally in your own organization in your own business if you're you know sitting in an office with this idea and you're like I'm gonna I'm gonna put this on the on the web and you know this is gonna be great great the cloud really does drive innovation in that sense um, and you're basically involved in business experimentation in that case because you don't know if it's gonna make you money you're just assuming and maybe it will so that's great people that have ideas can use the cloud and throw them up I mean how easy is it to go to like a GoDaddy and set up a website you know it's easy um, and then in terms of infrastructure as a service how easy is it to get a virtual server um, get a developer to work with it start to, you know throwing files up there and web pages and all sorts of other cool stuff video streaming who knows who knows what you're looking to do with it but ultimately you know the cloud doesn't necessarily drive innovation it provides a method for you at a lower cost to get your experimentation ideas out there right but a lot of folks once they reach a certain point in business their business changes they're not experimenting anymore they know what they have it's making them money they start thinking of ways to now take it out of the hands of cloud vendors and this is true you know the, it's one of the things that companies talk about all the time if they're using let's say a video streaming solution they constantly are looking at it and going you know we're, we're paying this company to do this can we do it ourselves can we get it out of their hands you know and it's just the you know sometimes that's just the case sometimes it's better to bring it back in-house or do it yourself and that's what Zynga found Zynga found that it was better to still use the cloud for certain things but to bring it back on-premise the next thing is big data demands big cloud okay so you know you're thinking of storage the fact that storage is cheap is cheap in-house you know as far as big data driving you know the need for big cloud you know the real problem there is that most companies that have this need for big data you know they they might in also be in big environments like banks hospitals government organizations and we've already talked about the security concerns so if you're talking about you know throwing your data into the cloud you know yes scalable cloud-based services will appeal to companies that are getting their data from the internet to begin with but when you're talking about privacy oriented firms or security sensitive firms or companies it's just not gonna they're not gonna be rushing to the cloud it's just not gonna happen so again what's your situation you have to make this decision ultimately in the end the last is that uh, mobile and cloud are a perfect matchup okay so a lot of folks believe that you know that because you know the mobility world putting things in the cloud you know it's a good match um, but let's be honest mobility is still in its infancy stage we cannot say when it will level off to determine the truth or inaccuracy of that promise that putting mobility solutions together with the cloud you gotta remember mobile right now it's a very hot trend and uh, when it comes to agility cloud-based approaches they have real appeal because they're agile they're they're easier to work with you know companies have decided to go with cloud-based solutions because it's faster and easier to get things up and running one good example um, John Brenzel of PBS uh, VP, he was the VP of products he says his network could not have scaled to meet fast-growing mobile video viewing demand without Amazon Web Services so they, they moved content and streaming video um, to Amazon Web Services they had more than 30 million unique visitors a month and an average of 115,000 unique mobile visitors per day they said they wouldn't have been able to do it right without Amazon Web Services so when you think about it you know that's that's a lot to think about as far as um, the solutions that require you know if you need to move fast it's a fast-paced world mobile makes it even faster um, you know PBS three years ago they were serving up about 200 terabytes of uh, streaming video per month well when the time this article was written where I'm getting my data from it says that today they are offering up more than 40 petabytes of video per month can you believe that you know that was after the that's one year after the debut of the PBS iPad app now they're streaming more than 40 petabytes what a huge you know difference the mobility world brings into play they could not have done it without the cloud so these two do seem to match up but that might simply be because it hasn't leveled off yet you know will the demand for streamed video and streaming you know solutions and data continue to go up most likely but we will hit a point where it levels off and we will have a, a clearer view of whether or not it's better to keep all of that in the cloud or bring it back in-house will PBS go to in-house at some point in the future like Zynga did maybe we don't know so here it is here's all the different um, solutions that are available you know here's the different promises that have been made here are some of the reality checks that are involved and it's great to be able to just talk about this 
right? So let me just be clear. I just want to conclude this on a on a more positive note. Um, I am not anti-cloud. I'm not anti-VDI either. Um, I believe that the cloud is the best option for software as a service solutions. You know, uh, education as a service solutions, and at times infrastructure as a service solutions. Right. The question is whether or not um, the solution is for your needs. And all I'm saying is don't buy into the hype. Stop. Question the marketing brochure, which is made by the same cloud vendor you're looking to bunk with, and consider all angles. Just, angles. Just like I said with VDI, remember, it's not a matter of saying, okay, this is good, this is bad. It's a matter of stopping, realizing that the, the material you've been reading is most likely presented to you from the same folks who are trying to sell it to you. Right? It, it's like... Um, it's like they say with um, supplements, right? Whether it's a vitamin supplements, that hey, when you're reading positive hype about those vitamin supplements, it's usually written by the vendor. So just take a moment and try to take an outside view of these things before you go spending money. Um, and I, I put a note down at the bottom: you might not want to throw away your Dell Reps number just yet. Uh, in other words, you may look at some of the newer solutions that are available, whether it's through Dell or others, in terms of uh, what they call convergent solutions where you can get a lot of the same benefits from cloud-based solutions, but you can get them in easy-to-install boxes that can, you can just purchase and install. You know, um, They handle the computing side, the storage side, the virtualization side, the management side. So um, you might just consider some of the other options out there. Because part of the frustration for some is that they look and they go, OK, so if I'm not going to move everything to the cloud, then you know what I have to do? I have to sit down and figure out what is the best hardware for my solutions moving forward. I'm looking to deploy Server 2012. That's going to mean some server upgrades. I'd like a virtualized solution. I'd like, you know, a higher performance networking between my servers. I'd like to have greater levels of availability. I need to worry about storage, storage throughput. You know, and you're going to have all this stuff in your head. Well, one of the nice things is that many of the hardware vendors, and Dell is included, especially Dell. Um, they've been working to try to eliminate this problem. They realize how easy it is to throw stuff to the cloud and uh, not worry about it anymore. Um, but they also feel that in many cases, as we've been talking about, it's better to keep things in-house. Uh, certainly better for them because they want to sell more servers. So they will help you to make these decisions. They will provide you with solutions that make it easy to just kind of snap and play. So again, just give this some thought before you make a decision one way or the other. In conclusion, VDI and cloud services are all the rage these days. These are the major buzzwords. You hear them, you've been reading about them, and sometimes they honestly do help, and sometimes the solutions being presented are just hype. So before you go into deep spending mode to alter your infrastructure internally with VDI, or before you drop services in-house and move them to the cloud, you have to ask yourself the following questions. Number one, will this decision save me money over time? Or will the cost actually be transferred to something else? Number two, will this truly mean less management work for me and my team? Or will it mean new worries and new work requiring more training? Number three, will this solve a problem for end users or create new ones, including hidden concerns with regard to security? And number four, am I making this decision because it is the cool thing to do, like we talked about SAN solutions of the early 2000s? Or is it the right thing to do for my company? OK, so hopefully you've enjoyed the discussion itself. We're going to go to the Q&A portion. And um, let's see. I'm looking at a couple of different questions here. I've already talked to Craig a little bit. We're going to talk more. Um, we're looking at uh, which is the best VDI solution we can get from service providers. Um, you know, that's a really good question. Every service provider is a little different in terms of uh, you know what they're offering. Um, I think a lot of the, a lot of times this comes down to religion, uh, you know, not true religion, but uh, from the standpoint of the viewpoint that you have with your vendor. Um, people that are VMware folks, they are incredibly loyal, and so you might talk to your VMware vendor and see what they're going to offer, what do they recommend all around in terms of uh, the clients that could be used and the, the types of solutions. Um, and then, you know, if you're not specific in terms of your vendor and you haven't made a final choice yet, you might start looking at cost then, because VMware um, uh, is, is certainly a, a good company, but Microsoft tends to be cheaper in the long run. <laughs> Kenneth, I like your, I thought there was going to be refreshments. I did too, to be honest with you, you know, but nobody's, nobody's brought me anything. Um, actually, Kenneth, uh, we're going to be shipping you refreshments to your door. So, uh, 
Let's see, we have a VMware now sells Kool-Aid. <laughs> yes, I think they might. Okay, good. Hey, this is, uh, this is less of a Q&A and more of a commentary. That's great. Um, so here's the thing. Obviously, you know, uh, we do have the one question about various hardware that uh, might go into a VDI deployment. And that is a good question because you do have to be concerned with uh, what, are your, what are you putting this all on? What kind of software are you using? Uh, what kind of hardware are you using if you're going to go with a VDI deployment? Again, we were just talking about the options that uh, the Dell is offering, convergence solutions. If you want to look those up, they have their blade arrays that are really pretty impressive. I'm really happy with those lately, you know, taking a look at the specs. Um, I don't work for Dell, so I'm not selling for them. I don't make any money off of any of the sales that, that they have. But, um, but I'm happy with their, uh, with their offerings. Um, I think it's exciting right now. You know, there's there's been a fire that's been lit under the whole industry, and uh, we see changes being made. Even this morning, I don't know if everyone saw that Dell um, is actually making a move to go private. Um, so they have their public company here, and it looks looks like they're going to buy up the stock and go private. Uh, pretty exciting. So we'll see how that uh, changes things. Uh, one question here: Is it better to use thin clients or zero clients in the infrastructure? Well, okay. So I like to break it down into fat, thin, or zero. And you know the what I like about zero clients is that there is you know the zero clients there. There are some who say they're zero clients, but they're actually thin clients. Either way, you're looking at a box that basically plugs into the network, plugs a mouse and keyboard in, plugs maybe audio in. Um, so it has to have some working parts, but uh, in some cases, those the thin clients actually require a little bit more, um, you know, of an oper like requires a basic operating system. And that extra operating system layer, you know, can cause problems. Um, but what I love about thin clients and zero clients is that they're throwaways. Um, not that you like to throw away things you've paid for, but you know, if anything breaks, you pick it up and throw it away. It's just a little box, you know. And you can, um, you know, you can go that route. So I personally like uh, to go with. There's a zero client solution. I can't remember the exact name of it right now, but I'll have to look it up for you guys. Um, but it's just a little box. You plug everything in. Great for VDI. Uh, question is, can you convert an old desktop PC into a zero thin client? Uh, no, no. Well, I mean, I don't think you can. It was certainly not a, a zero client. So the way that the old desktop PC would work in this case is, you can do like an XP. Let's say it's an XP system. Um, you can basically uh, do a remote desktop connection. We call it a fat client, really, because you, you've got this. In, you know, whenever you do a remote desktop connection off of a, an, an existing operating system like Microsoft's Windows operating system. You've got a fat client there. Um, zero or thin, like or thin clients, typically use a, a real thin operating system, like a Linux-based operating system, um, to make the connection. So, I mean, can you do it? Yeah, I, I bet you can. Um, you know, figure out a way to do it somehow. I just have never researched that or played with it. I don't see why you would. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Does the processing being done on the server side? Uh, oh, there's a lot. Okay. Um, Hey, now we got all these questions coming in. This is great. So let, let me just answer the uh, the thing with the VDI uh, solution. Do you need special hardware upgrades in the future or one-time investment only? Um, so to set up virtual desktop infrastructure, you're basically going to have to have a virtualized solution where you set up multiple versions of the same operating system, and then everybody gets their own operating system. So you know, it, they really do have their own desktop. They have their own operating system. It's different from terminal services in that sense, and that's why a lot of end users like it, in the sense that their desktop is their desktop. Uh, their system is their system. It's just floating in a virtual environment as opposed to being installed directly on their system. Um, and yes, you will need special hardware for that. Um, you know, <clears throat> as far as it being a one-time investment, you hope it's a one-time investment to start with. But obviously, as things progress, you know, you you may need uh, to upgrade some of the hardware. Um, as advancements are made in the technology, you may need to, you know, advance the technology in-house. So yeah, you'll be pouring some money into it over the time. You know, that's just inevitable. Let's see. Uh, I see Office 365 with zero client Office 365 solution. What will be the effect on the internet bandwidth? Uh, great question. You know, to be honest with you, I I don't know as far as the you know as different organizations have different bandwidth issues. Um, that's something you'll have to check with, uh, you know, in terms of your own environment. Uh, let's see. Can I implement VDI with Hyper Hyper of Microsoft like other product of VDI? Um, yes, no. You can use uh, Hyper V for your VDI deployment. Absolutely. Uh, there's things that you'll have to do, just like with any virtualization deployment solution. You'll have to make certain decisions in terms of how you're going to utilize it, what tools you're going to use, 
and how to you know streamline it, optimize it. Um, and typically that involves purchasing other third-party solutions. So again, it's sort of a mix and match here. Uh, you know, Microsoft may have some recommendations in terms of vendors they work with for some of these pieces, but you know, and it's wise to listen to them because they typically know who works best with their solutions. But you know, what this this is actually a good idea for perhaps a future discussion, having a discussion on what are the pieces of EDI, what are the vendors, how do they work together, what are their pitches. Um, and what's nice is I can go back to VMware and Microsoft and just say, hey, what are your, your pitches for this? Um, how do you put these things together um, in packages for folks? Like what would you recommend for third-party optimization for storage throughput and so forth? Um, you know, per per personally, I like a product called Atlantis Ilio for storage throughput. Um, it, it enhances the optimization of the storage throughput, which is one of the biggest um, issues when it comes to VDI-based solutions is the storage throughput. Okay, well, it looks like we are at the end of our time. I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer all of the questions here. Um, some of them are very specific. So what we're going to do is uh, we will follow up with a future discussion on VDI, a little more specific. Uh, perhaps we can even pull in a good friend of mine, David Davis, and we can see what he thinks about all of these different things. If he's listening out there today, he might be shaking his head because he may not agree with some of the points that I made. So uh, I challenge him. I challenge him to come back and tell us what he thinks at a future time. And uh, perhaps we can also share our thoughts regarding the differences in solutions between Microsoft's VMware and uh, Hyper-V, uh, rather Microsoft's Hyper-V and VMware's uh, ESX and their solutions when it comes to VDI. All right. So just to conclude here, if you want, you can read my InfoWorld column on Enterprise Windows. And that's located, as you can see there. You can go to the InfoWorld.com website and find me under the blogs. Um, you can email me at peter at trainsignal.com. You can follow me on Twitter at JP Brzezzi. Uh, so a lot of ways to get in touch with me. By all means, email me with any of these questions that you feel uh, you'd like answers to and for more follow-up afterwards. And this webinar will be available at uh, www.trainsignal.com forward slash blog forward slash webinars in a few days. And now we'll turn things back over to uh, Dana, our sponsor.